for this evening's tithes and offerings and you give as God's blessed. Thank God for those that give with a cheerful heart. Amen. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Oh, how great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. So everything you give uh, helps uh, lower the cost uh, that we're going to pay off that youth building. Uh, we're praying uh, next year, hopefully. And so everything you give tonight goes to cover that. Brother Allen, would you pray for us tonight? So we have a quartet and we have a quintet. So we're asking the boys quintet to come tonight. Give them a hand as they come to sing for us this evening.
Hallelujah. 
love Jesus, yes I do. I love Jesus, he's my Savior. Jesus smiles and loves me too. Man, give them another hand. Yeah. Wonderful job. Yeah. Wonderful job. Don't you love seeing young people sing for the Lord? Oh Amen. Well, it's good to have Brother Aaron tonight uh, to preach for us. I was in Alabama last week, and everybody knows Aaron and Brina in Alabama. I, I just, yeah. everybody. And uh, so many good things said about him, but there was one young man. He said, I just want you to know that Aaron... Uh, he drove someone home all the way from southeastern to Alabama and got, got in about midnight. And uh, he heard that I was going through some things. And he drove over and spoke with me till 3 in the morning. And he said, that conversation changed my life. And I'm in the ministry today because of that conversation. And I, I praise God for Aaron and Brina and for God bringing them into our church, our lives. You give him a hand as he comes to speak to us this evening. Well, it is wonderful to be with you tonight. Uh, I know uh, uh, maybe the last time I got up here, I didn't have all of this right here. And uh, you know what they say, happy wife, happy life. And it, it wasn't my choice, it was hers. But I think there's another purpose to it. Uh, it helps when we have visitors come to youth group, they actually recognize I'm the youth pastor and not just another teenager. So it, it really helps with that. Uh, but no, I, I am certainly excited to share my heart with you tonight. And uh, uh, I'm very excited about what the Lord is doing in our youth group, and uh, I, I, I couldn't say this enough. I am so thankful for the opportunity I have to serve here. I'm thankful for each one of you. I'm thankful for our youth group. Uh, the Lord has blessed us abundantly, and, and it, it's been one of those moments, I, I feel like, uh, leading into the school year, uh, specifically me, I've just kind of reflected on what I've seen God do this summer, uh, seeing one of our own answer the call to preach seeing many of our students rededicate their lives. Uh, in just a few weeks, I'll be going to the beach to baptize some students. And just uh, so many exciting things. And then we go to nationals, and we see some of our own students uh, just go up and wax eloquent of God's word. And uh, some of them are leading worship and doing what God has created them to do. And to say that my heart's been overflowing would be an understatement. And to say that we're blessed would be an understatement. And uh, I'm so thankful uh, for what the Lord's done and what he's going to do, because I firmly believe that the best is yet to come. Amen. The Lord has more in store. Yeah. And with the youth group, I, I am so excited as we kick, uh, kick off uh, this school year. Uh, we have actually 12 vocalists for our youth praise band, uh, many, instrument, in, many instrumentalists. We're having a music workshop next Saturday. A few other tricks up our sleeve for that. Uh, we have some awesome sermon series I'm excited to go through. Uh, we're starting this week a two-part series on success in transition from the book of Joshua. We're going to look at the prodigal son parable. Uh, we're going to be talking about my story for God's glory. In the spring, we're going to be going over the book of Jonah. Uh, just a multitude of things that I am so excited about. And I know as we enter into this season of life, things get busy quick. Uh, with school starting back up, I know there's a lot of parents that are happy. And you've probably been quoting Matthew 28, 20 often. Uh, just the first part where it says, therefore, go. And uh, yeah, excited to get the kids out of the house and get, get your mind back. Uh, I can definitely understand that. And uh, I, I know you're probably a little worn down, busy. School is coming up. Monday's coming. And for just a few moments, I do want to preach to you a very just practical message. Uh, admittedly, I was really wrestling this afternoon on what to preach. And uh, I... Sometimes I, I really think my wife is the Holy Spirit uh, because I was wrestling between do I want to preach this big, dynamic, awesome message that I think would just be great or do I want to preach a practical message that the Lord's laid on my heart? And she so adequately reminds me, as she often does, who are you preaching for? You have to preach for the audience of one. And so I just want to deliver a very simple and practical message from and a reminder as we go into this very busy season of life for us. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 5. 
First Peter chapter number five is where we're going to spend our time uh, this evening. Now, let me go ahead and set the stage for what we're going to be reading. Uh, the context of this epistle or this letter is it's written by the Apostle Peter. And he's writing it to the Christians scattered abroad. Now, you have to understand why the Christians are scattered abroad. They are scattered abroad due to the persecution that has been raining upon them. Now, this epistle is written in, from Rome during the time frame of 63 to 64 AD, which is extremely important because the terrible persecution that would come under the reign of Nero began around this time. Now, if you don't know anything about Nero, you uh, should know that he is the emperor that burned down uh, most of the city of Rome for his own financial purposes so he could rebuild it in his own way. And then in the process of that, he just blames it on the Christians. He was a very wicked man. Right. His persecution ultimately led to Peter being martyred in 67 AD. But I want you to understand the purpose of this letter. We, we always have to understand everything that is written in the Bible is written for a purpose. Every letter is written to someone with a specific purpose. And Peter writes this letter to the Christians scattered abroad to encourage them to face persecution so that those around them can clearly see the grace and the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ as they go through these trials. Now, chapter 4 is where Peter talks about being stewards of God's grace and suffering as a Christian. We get to chapter 5, and you would see in verses 1 through 4, he gives them an exhortation to elders. And I want to pick up reading in verse 5 of chapter number 5. I hope you're there with me. The Bible says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. And I want you to see this phrase. This phrase is extremely important. If you highlight or underline in your Bibles, I want to encourage you to highlight or underline this phrase right here, and it's where it says, and be clothed with humility. Yeah. And that phrase is interesting because we're going to come to understand that this is the only instance in where it appears throughout all of Scripture. Very important. Go with me, though. For God resisteth the proud right. and giveth grace to the humble. Uh-huh. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. An iconic verse that we often know about, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Aren't you thankful he cares for you? Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And I would read verse 10, but I don't want us to be here until 8 o'clock tonight. But what we see right here in these verses is that Peter makes a very big emphasis on humility to one another, but most importantly to God, that we're to cast our cares onto God and be weary and of and resist the devil who is our enemy. And I want you to see how he describes Satan here as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Right. I really want to focus in on what we've read this evening because I believe we see a great truth in this passage of Scripture. I'll be honest with you, what I'm sharing with you tonight is not anything new. It's not going to be anything that's going to blow your mind. It's not uh, going to be anything shocking to you. But I believe if we understand the truth found in this passage of Scripture, it will help us in some incredible ways. I want to preach to you a message tonight entitled, The Secret Weapon of Spiritual Warfare. The Secret Weapon of Spiritual Warfare. As uh, we go about our days and as we live in culture, we often see a very consistent recurring storyline in multiple areas of our lives. And that recurring storyline that is often used time and time and time again is the plot of good versus evil. We turn on the television, we watch movies, we watch TV shows, and we see it's the superheroes versus the bad guys. We see it in Star Wars, whether it's the rebels versus the empire. We see it in sports, and where uh, we were at North Carolina, the University of North Carolina was the good guys, and Duke was the bad guys. Now, down here, you have UF, and you have uh, FSU, and then you have Miami, and I'm going to let you guys figure that one out. I'm going to stay off of that. Don't want to split the church over that. We see that in politics and in news. One party's the good guys, one party's the bad guys, and it often is determined by what channel you're watching that day. We see it in history, World War II, the Allies versus the Axis powers. 
we see this recurring evil, uh, uh, this recurring theme of good versus evil. And all those things I just mentioned, they do represent good versus evil. And though the stakes may be high in each scenario, they are not as high as the invisible warfare that takes place around us every single day of our lives. Yeah. Ephesians uh, 612 tells us about this spiritual warfare. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Angels, demons, and Satan are at a constant war right now, and it will affect your life. That's why Ephesians 611 tells us to put on the whole armor of God. I want to make this statement, and then we'll dive right into this. Spiritual warfare occurs every day, and I'd be willing to say every moment of our lives. It is inevitable because these spiritual battles determine our mental and physical battles, and therefore it determines our attitude and our actions. And can I just say this to you? Satan wants to destroy you, and he wants to destroy your family. Sure. Satan is not here to play a game. He's not playing around. He, he's not timid. He, he's not going to hesitate. He is waiting for each and every moment to attack you and to attack your family. He has an arsenal full of weapons. He knows every single weakness that you have, and he is not going to wait, and he is just waiting for that one moment he can get a hold of you and render you useless for the cause of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And like I said, my friend, if he can't get you, you yeah. better believe he'll go for your family. Absolutely. And so how do we deal with an enemy that is described as a roaring lion? Well, thankfully, I believe that we see a secret weapon described right here in this passage of Scripture. So this evening, I want to give you a command. I want to give you a call to action. And I want to give you something that you need to be continually doing. I believe the first thing we see right here this evening is there is a command to be humble. There's a command to be humble. Go back with me to verses 5 and 6. The Bible says there, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the, unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Notice verse 6. Notice the command given there. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Yeah. It's very apparent through the writings of Peter that God is commanding and desires for us to be humble. Not only to be humble to those around us, but to be humble ultimately to God. And can I say this? If you're humble before God, you'll be humble before others. Yeah, right. and see, I, I love what an individual, H.A. Ironside, says about this. Because here's the reality. The opposite of humility is pride. Right. H.A. Ironside said, pride is the barrier of all spiritual progress. Well, why is pride such a barrier, though? Notice what the Bible says right there in verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And if you go back to verse 5, uh, it, it talks about how God resisted the proud. Well, we see that very clearly in the text. You can read your Bible every day. You can pray for hours on end. You can go to church, and you, you can go to every activity we have, and you can do all these good Christian things. Man, you can hop in the car on the way home and turn on 91.95 K-Love and listen to all that. But hear me, you will not grow spiritually if there is pride in your life. Yeah. It is a barrier to all progress. So you must humble yourself. Yes. Can I tell you this, though? Pride is natural. Pride, pride is something we all naturally struggle with. Part of being a human is that we're all naturally prideful. And pride, it comes in many different forms. Many different forms, many different shapes and sizes. But I believe the two most common we see is it comes in self-exaltation. In the sense that we believe that we are better and greater than everyone else. And listen, you, you may sit there and say, well, Pastor Aaron, look at me, I'm not better than anybody. And you may not flaunt it academically or athletically. You may not flaunt it materially, but so often we as believers, we become prideful spiritually. Yeah. You say, Brother Aaron, how do you know that? Because so often, so many of us, we just come to church, we sit down in the pew, we cross our arms and say, all right, pastor, impress me. Yeah. Tell me something I've never heard before. Yeah. Right. Can we be honest? Yeah. Can we say that we've been there? And so often the, the pastor will preach a message and instead of getting out the rake because we need it, we'd rather get out the shovel because somebody else does. And we miss out on God doing something special. And we miss out on God speaking to us because our pride gets in the way. Pride comes in the form of self-exaltation, but I also believe it comes in the form of self-deprecation. 
in which we put ourselves down, claim that we're insufficient, claim that we're pathetic and useless, and we put ourselves down and much lower than everyone around us. And at first, self-deprecation comes across as humility. But let's be honest, what it really is, is we're telling God that what he has made and what he has done and how he has loved us is not good enough. And that we don't deserve it and that we're not there yet and we're not up to the par that we need to be. And so often we wrestle with that. I see more teenagers today struggle with self-confidence and self-image. And they they pass on this humor of self-deprecation just to cover themselves up. But so often we all do that. We all put ourselves down. We all try and hide it. By the way, it's possible to struggle with both sides of this. It's easy to struggle with pride in the form of self-exaltation and self-deprecation, but regardless of the side of the coin, it's still pride. And we know the old adage, for the pride comes to fall. And we see that often. We must be, as verse 5 says, clothed with humility. I really wanted to make an emphasis on that phrase because Albert Barnes, he mentions that phrase is used nowhere else in Scripture. It's, uh, and it implies to put on a garment, which in the original word of clothed in the Greek, it makes a specific implication of an outward garment worn by a servant. So the picture that Peter is painting here is whenever he talks about clothing yourself in humility, it would just be like a servant waking up and they put on the out, outward garment to clothe themselves. Now we've got to remember, this is Peter writing this. This is the same Peter that spent three and a half years of his life with Jesus Christ. Yeah. This is the same Peter that watched Jesus wake up every single day and clothe himself with humility. And can we remember what Jesus himself said in Mark 10, 45? For the Son of Man, man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. What Peter saw Jesus do every single day was wake up and clothe himself with humility. Because we know Jesus came in the form of a servant. So it's no surprise that Peter calls us and instructs us to do the same. Because if we are truly going to be humble before God, we must clothe ourselves with humility. Warren W. Wiersbe says this means to be controlled by a humble spirit or to be a servant. You may say, Pastor Aaron, why do I need to humble myself, though? Why do I need to humble myself before God? I want to give you this. We humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God because it is through him and his hand that we're able to do anything. Whether we're in the midst of a trial, whether we are being delivered from a trial, we must submit ourselves wholly and completely to his sovereign rule and his plan for our lives. And through that, he will exalt us in due time. James 4.10 says this, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. We're not in charge of lifting ourselves up. I I think it's interesting. The Bible never tells us to lift ourselves up. The Bible says for us to let the Lord lift us up. The only one we are to lift up is Jesus Christ. I'll go a little bit further though. I love what one writer says in relation to verse 6. He says, if we humble not ourselves under God's grace, he will humble us under his judgments. Those who patiently submit to him, he exalts in due due time. If his hand be mighty to depress, it is also mighty to exalt. So understand me clearly, believer. Understand me clearly, church family. When we humble ourselves under the hand of God, he will be the one to lift us up in his time. But if we choose not to humble ourselves, then he will do the humbling. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I'd rather humble myself now than let God humble me later. Because when he carries it out, he'll make sure we stay down for a little bit. So I think, first and foremost, we see a command to be humble. We need to start there. Uh, We spend a lot of time there just so you could really understand the importance of this. I want you to see this. Number two, a call to cast our cares. A call to cast our cares. Verse 7, the Bible says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. That word casting in the Greek, it literally means to throw upon. It's, it's a very, uh, in my opinion, active verb right there we see, where it's talking about literally throwing upon your burdens to God, literally just tossing what you have upon your shoulders to God. I like what one writer says. He says it means to commit your whole cause to him, to give your whole cause unto God. 
So we are to cast and commit everything to him, whether it's trials and tribulations or even the emotion of feeling insufficient or overwhelmed. We give it all to God and we rely on him and his sovereign plan to sustain us while we remain surrendered to him. So often, I I, want to be honest with you, so often we hear from the pulpit that uh, we need to leave our burdens at the door. So often we hear from church people and maybe you hop on Facebook and you constantly see, well, you just need to leave your burdens at the door. Listen, that is a load of baloney. Bring your burdens in the church door so you can come down and leave them at the altar and give them to God. Give them to the one who can actually deal with it for a moment. Bring your burdens, bring your struggles, bring your trials in with you. That way you can put them at the altar and give them to God. Not only was God willing to send his son for our sins, he is also willing to take all of our cares because he loves us that much. I want you to think about this for a moment with me. The reason we are able to give God all of our cares is because God gave his son. So we could have the relationship with him to give him our cares. You understand how this transpires. We could not give God any of our cares until he first gave his son. And then once we enter into that relationship with him, through believing in his son as the Lord and Savior of our lives, then we can give God all our cares. So my simple question for you this evening is, what do you have on your shoulders and why is it still there? Maybe something's going on at home and it's weighing you down. Maybe an incident happened in the workplace and it's been bothering you, keeping you up at night. Maybe there's a relationship that isn't going as smoothly as you expected it to be. You do not have to carry that believer. You are able to give that to God and he will deal with it accordingly. But maybe you can't get the burden off your shoulders. Maybe you can't give it to God. And maybe the reason you can't do that is, if you, is because you have never first put your faith and trust in his son as the Lord and Savior of your life. And if you haven't done that, then my friend, that's where it begins. For us to give him our cares, we must first know his son as Lord and Savior. I genuinely believe some of the grace that God gives to the humble is the ability to cast our cares onto him. Right here in verse 7, one of the most iconic verses, we find some of the most comforting words in Scripture, knowing that we can give God all of our cares, knowing that we can cast on any affliction, any burden, any emotion to him, and knowing that he will take care of it for us. I want to give you this, and then I'll move on. For us to have victory in spiritual warfare, we must give God all of our care but we cannot if we're not humble before him. See this. Please get this. This is a big point. You see, before you can do what verse 7 calls you to do, you have to do what verses 5 and 6 command you to do. Before you can cast all your cares unto God, you first have to obey that command to be humble. Yeah. Because here's the reality of the matter. You can't cast your cares unto God if you're not first humble before God. Yeah. Why? Because God resisteth the proud. And we know that at the end of the day, whenever we're prideful and we're, we're puffed up with pride, we think we can handle the things of this life. But we know deep down inside we can't. So Christian, what do you have on your shoulders and why is it still there? I want to encourage you, whatever's on there, give it to God. Thirdly, finally, I want you to see this. Continue, we are to be continually watching for and resisting the enemy. Look at verses 8 and 9 with me for just a moment. The Bible says there, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Notice, I really want to do this for a second. Notice the words that Peter uses to describe Satan in these verses. He opens up by calling him your adversary. Understand me clearly, Satan is your enemy. He does not desire to be your friend. He's not someone to mess with or spend time with. He's not someone that our culture portrays him with as just the dark side or or someone who wants to get you involved in some fun. No, Satan is your enemy and he wants to destroy you and he wants to live you broken and useless. There's no way around that. The word adversary, it's interesting, in the Greek, it actually means an opponent, specifically an opponent in a lawsuit. You see, Satan is taking you to court, and he's not there for a simple settlement. He wants everything you got and then some. 
He wants to leave you absolutely empty, broken, and alone. That's his goal. The word adversary goes even further, though, when referring to Satan, noting him as the arch enemy, meaning there is no evil, no force, no monster, no demon higher than Satan. He is quite literally the supreme evil, and I want you to understand this, he's coming for you, and he's coming for your family, and he's coming for your spouse, and he's coming for your children, and he will not stop until he gets them. Peter then describes Satan as a roaring lion. And this is important because for the readers of this letter, that description of a roaring lion would have sent chills down their spine because they know exactly what Peter is talking about as they have seen and have heard of many other believers being devoured by lions in the Colosseum, many of them being put to death. This lion is a ferocious beast that will have caused these Christians to tremble in fear. And to make it even worse, I want you to notice how Peter describes this lion. It's one that's roaring about freely. It's not contained to a cage. It's not contained to just a building. This lion is roaring around, seeking who he will devour, making his presence known wherever he goes. I think it's interesting. Satan is described in, and he tempts us in three different forms, according uh, to Albert Clark. He comes as a serpent to beguile our sins, pervert our judgment, and enhance our imagination. He comes as an angel of light to deceive us with a false view of spiritual teachings. And then he comes as a roaring lion to beat and bear us down and destroy us by violent opposition, persecution, and death. Which is pretty fitting that Peter uses that description for the believers that he's writing to. I know what you're sitting there thinking. Pastor, and this is pretty doom and gloom. I don't, I don't think it could rain anymore on a my day. But thankfully, we see that the Lord provides for us a way of escape and a way of attack. I want you to notice the word sober there. It appears right there in verse 8. The word sober in the Greek, it means to avoid the drunkenness of your senses. To have a sound mind. Where I'm from in East Tennessee, it means to have your head on straight. The word vigilant, it means to be awake and to be watchful. Looking about, scanning, always checking, always looking behind you, making sure that Satan is nowhere to be found. We must be of sound mind and consistently aware and watching because Satan wants to devour us. He wants to destroy us and he's actively searching for an opportunity, even right now, to attack you right now. But hear me on this. You will not be of sound mind. You will not be awake and aware and watching if you are so weighed down by burdens and trials that are upon your shoulders. You will not be able to look for and try and seek, and you will not be sober or be vigilant if you can't even get your mind off what's going on in your life right now. I kind of hope how you're seeing this occur, what it all stems from. You see, if we are not humble and instead prideful, we can't cast our cares to God meaning the cares have to stay upon our shoulders. And we're so distracted by the cares that we, can have, we can't be sober, we can't be vigilant, we can't have a sound mind, we can't be awake and watching. And we're so distracted by everything around us that Satan's able to just walk right in and devour us. Hear me on this. Our pride makes us pray. Our pride is what dest- destroys us. Our pride is what allows Satan to get in and get that wiggle room and get just enough to get in there and wreck our lives. Our pride is what makes us easy. Rather, if we submit ourselves to God and humble ourselves before him, casting all our care upon him, and through that we're sober, we're vigilant, we're consistently watching and aware aware of where the devil is, we can do what verse 9 says, which is resist him. And we can fight him back and we can keep him away. And we can do that by resting in the arms of God. I like what James 4, 7 says. It says, submitting yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. See, we are able to resist the devil by confiding in God, which only comes through submission to God and humility before God. Listen, I I don't know about you, I'm thankful that God has made a way for us to fight against Satan and to win that battle. It all begins with humility. Can I give you a statement? I hope you'll remember it. Humility always finds its home in the hands of God. Humility will always find its home in the hands of God. 
one of my favorite things about cars today is that they have cruise control. I love uh, driving through East Tennessee and driving through the mountains and putting the car on cruise control. Uh, mainly because cruise control keeps me out of trouble and going a little bit faster than I need to. But the only problem with cruise control, especially whenever you're going through somewhere beautiful, is it's easy to get distracted. And it's easy to take our eyes off the wheel. And it's easy to just look to the side for just one second. And that one second becomes a few more. For many of us, we're about to enter into a very busy season of life. Many of you, you have children going to school right now. Work may be getting a little bit more intense. Uh, some of you, the football or volleyball schedule is about to pick back up. Fall sports are about to kick off. And life is about to get busy. And in moments of busyness, it is so easy for the first thing that we do is we put our spiritual lives on cruise control. And we just start coasting. And our pride makes us say, no, you're good. It's all right. It's all good. No, you're still growing. You're still there. You're still faithful. You're still consistent. And hear me. Whenever we get on spiritual cruise control, we have a tendency to get distracted. We'll take our eyes off the road, and before we even know it, we're on a head-on collision. And all that spiritual progress we make comes to a screeching halt. And we're forced to pick up the pieces and start all over again. I want to encourage you. Don't let your pride put you in spiritual cruise control. Don't let your pride make you pray to Satan. I think about during the battleness of the wilderness and the Civil War, there's a Union general by the name of John Sedgwick. He's inspecting his troops, and they're getting ready for battle, and at one point, he comes to a parapet. And he's going through, and he gazes out in the direction of the enemy. His officer suggested that this was unwise, and perhaps he ought to duck, uh, to duck while passing the parapet. Nonsense, the general. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. A moment later, Union general John Sedgwick Sedgwick falls to the ground, fatally wounded, shot. I love what the great evangelist D.L. Moody said. Be humble or you'll stumble. I believe J.C. Ryle gives a very staggering statement on this, and I'll, I'll leave you with this. Open sin, kill, open sin kills thousands of souls. Self-righteousness kills tens of thousands. My friend, we have an enemy who is walking around this very moment. He is more powerful than you could possibly imagine. He has every single weapon at his disposal. He knows every single weakness you and your family members have. And he is seeking to destroy you. And if he can't get to you, he's going to get to your family. My question for you is this. Are you going to allow yourself to become prey? Or will you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God? Let him exalt you. Let him take your cares so you can be sober and be vigilant and so you can resist the devil. That's my question for you. When was the last time you humbled yourself before God? We all need to, and we all have to come to that point. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I, I appreciate your attentiveness. I know I've been a little all over the place. Um, and I appreciate you listening so well. And I just have two simple questions for you, and then I'll get out of the way. You're here tonight, and you'd be willing to say, Brother Aaron, I have never trusted Christ as my Savior. Brother Aaron, you were talking about casting your cares to God, and I haven't been able to cast my cares to God because I don't know God. I don't have a relationship with God. I've never placed my faith and trust in Jesus as the Lord and Savior of my life. But Brother Aaron... I want to. I want to make that decision tonight. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. If that's a decision you'd be willing to make, I want to encourage you. Just slip your hand in the air so I can pray for you. I wouldn't embarrass you. I wouldn't call you out. I would never do anything like that. Thank you for your honesty. You're here tonight and you'd be willing to say, Brother Aaron, I need to humble myself before the Lord. I need to cast my cares onto him. I need to be sober and be vigilant. Pastor, and I, I don't want to become prey to the devil. I don't want to go on spiritual cruise control. I want to grow spiritually during this time, and I am willing to humble myself before the Lord because that is the secret weapon of spiritual warfare. 
How many of you would be willing to say, Brother Aaron, I want to humble myself before the Lord? I just want to encourage you, just slip your hand in there. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. Brother Ron is going to sing. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand to your feet. And if you need to come to this altar, go ahead and come. I want to encourage you, make that decision. Kneel with a family of believers that will pray for you and love you. ask all those going to college, if you'll come forward, we want to pray for you. We want to gather around you. Just come come on forward. Ask the parents to follow them up. And I uh, just want to say a word of prayer over them yes, before sir. they uh, yes. head back to school. Let them know we love them. We're praying yes, for them. Sir. Just go ahead and have a, have a kneel before there. Anyone to gather God around and, and, and uh, pray over these boys and girls. Bless you, ladies. And we'll girls. lift them up in God. prayer. <laughs> and as we continue to sing, we'll pray. Near the cross, a trembling soul, love and mercy found. There, love and mercy message tonight. I'm asking to make his way back to the vestibule. I have one announcement. I want to remind you, uh, uh, Miss Betty Pope's funeral uh, is this Wednesday at Hopewell. Uh, viewings at 10 a.m. and then service will be at 11 a.m. That's this Wednesday at Hopewell. Any other announcements before we are dismissed? All right. Seeing none. Hope to see you on Wednesday night. Have another good time in the Lord. Uh, we had conference yesterday, and I'm telling you, uh, Jeff White, Chris Rollins preached two of the best messages you'll ever hear. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it was it was phenomenal, both of them, and uh, we love them, we appreciate them. Jeff, I'm going to ask you to close us in prayer.